Welcome, thank you for coming and uh, being early so we can start on time. If you've all got your seats now, that's great. Um, let me introduce myself, my name is Peter Lees, I'm a Chief Technologist for SUSE in Asia Pacific. And it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Christopher Grondland. Uh, he's a senior developer at SUSE and he's architect of SUSE's high availability extension. So like many of our developers, uh, Chris works from home, which in his case is in Sweden. And uh, this is his first trip to Australia, and in fact, the first trip to the Southern Hemisphere, which shows that he doesn't do things by halves. If you're going to go south, go way south. So today he'll be presenting on package managers all the way down. And with no further ado, please welcome Chris. Thank you. Uh, is, is the mic on? Yeah, OK. Uh, so, yeah, so the talk is called Package Managers All the Way Down. Uh, so obviously I'm going to talk about package managers. Um, as you may notice, I have a little bit of problem t saying the word package manager, uh, being a non-native speaker, and I'm going to screw it up even more when I try to say language package manager, which I'm going to be doing a lot. So hopefully we can get through this together. Um, I noticed that there was another talk earlier in the conference called Turtles All the Way Down. So in case you don't know the reference, that's the phrase to search for. Um, another title for this talk might be something like that. Uh, I'm going to talk about something that's been frustrating me. But I think the implications of the things that have been frustrating me have been is something that might actually lead to some really cool new things and some big changes in uh, the Linux world. Uh, and I'll do my best to kind of guess where things are going and what those changes might be. Uh, yeah, I also put this in there. Uh, I'm really excited to be here and happy to be here. And it's been an amazing conference. And I was so excited by the possibility of maybe seeing a kangaroo that I bought a camera just for that purpose. And I managed to do it, so I'm, I'm very happy. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, and also if, so I haven't owned the camera for very long, so if I've been pointing a camera at you and it's been very uncomfortable, then I'm sorry about that. I, I just don't know how to use it properly. Uh, yeah, I work for SUSE. Um, uh, now, uh, Peter already said the, most of the things I'm going to say here, but um, I wanted to say that we are hiring. There is like 60 open positions, something like that. There's going to be even more coming soon. And uh, it's a great place to work if you want to work on free software, emphasis, emphasis on free software and GPL. And uh, yeah, uh, I work from home. If you, if you like to avoid wearing pants, it's also a great place to work. Um, <laughs> yeah, and also I'm from Sweden. Um, I, I kind of, in the interest of um, non-native speaker uh, interoperability, as was talked about yesterday, uh, I'm going to give you like a little secret about Swedes that maybe not everyone knows. And this is also th true for Finns who speak Swedish. So um, yeah, you may use that information. Um, so Swedish people don't understand swear words, because in Swedish, we don't really have swear words. We have swear words, but uh, they're, they're on the level of, oh, heck. So uh, we, we, we just don't, we're kind of blind, culturally blind to the effects of that. So if I at any point start speaking like an angry sailor, then it's just, you know, accidental. I'm sorry. Uh, we also like to apologize a lot, so that's, that's another thing. Uh, and yeah, this is what it looks like. I'm happy to be here. The weather is nice. Uh, yeah, so what's a package manager? Um, the first kind of package manager that I'm going to be talking about is the distribution package manager. So that's something like uh, apt or zipper or DNF or uh, emerge, I think, and uh, things like this. So it's, it's a tool that serves a number of purposes in distributions. Uh, and that kind of makes it a little bit hard to talk about package managers in general terms, because uh, the, the software and the, the world has so many meanings. Uh, and the scope of the package managers has kind of grown over time. Uh, so I'm going to try to like nail down a little bit more what, what they do. So 
In the early days of Linux, um, the border between a developer and a system administrator and a user was pretty much non-existent. Uh, to, to set up Linux, you basically had to be able to compile software and figure out dependencies and uh, solve versioning conflicts, apply patches, all of the things to yourself. So the first package managers were kind of uh, operating system construction tools. And I know that there were package managers before Linux, but kind of a inaccurate history of things. Um, and there, there are like a few key things that distribution package managers do. And uh, I've pulled out like four things that I think are important. Um, so the first one is that a package manager helps developers manage dependencies. So that's kind of keeping track of what libraries and other things have to be present to build the software that they are doing and relying, making it easy to rely on other people to keep those dependencies up to date and get patches and so on. Um, and the term dependency hell uh, largely refers to issues that you get when you don't have a package manager or if your package manager is some way, in some way failing you. That is. Uh, you depend on something, and that depends on something, and you, know, you want to depend on something else, and then those two dependencies are clashing, and maybe they're different versions, and yeah, you get into trouble. Uh, this used to be very common. This is less common, but as we'll see, maybe more common uh, in the future. Um, the second aspect of a package manager is uh, helping users install software. Uh, so there's like a second set of dependencies, which are the dependencies that a piece of software needs in order to actually run. So after you've built the software, now you need to run the software. And the dependencies that you needed to build the software are not the same dependencies as those that you need to run the software. And the, pa the package manager also serves the purpose of providing those dependencies for users so that they can install the software and get everything that's needed to actually run it. Um, and then the third aspect of a package manager is helping system administrators ensure that different systems are actually up to date. So once the system is up and running, there needs to be some way to update it, to check if new versions of software are available, to provide uh, security patches, and so on, uh, and then update systems with these changes. Um, and then the fourth and final thing on my list, uh, there may be even more, is uh, helping distributions and uh, providers of uh, open source um, operating systems uh, manage metadata about the software that's in the operating system. So this is tracking what licenses different software actually contains and tracking other kinds of metadata um, about that software. Um, from this point on, I'm mostly going to focus on the first of these. So that's uh, helping developers manage dependencies. Um, that's going to be like my primary thing I'm going to talk about. Uh, but it's important to remember that a package manager in distributions actually does a lot more than that. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a big piece of software. Uh, so, and the reason that I'm going to focus on the first part is that there is another type of package manager uh, out there as well. Uh, and I'm going to call that the language package manager. I probably should have chosen a different word since I have great difficulty saying that, but I'm going to, do, I'm going to try. Um, so language package managers are usually tied to a specific programming language, hence the name. Uh, so some examples of those are Bundler for Ruby, or Cabal for Haskell, or NPM for JavaScript, for example. Um, I honestly don't really know the history of these kinds of package managers. Uh, I'm kind of guessing, guessing that they started with Perl and PPM um, because they're kind of associated with scripting languages in, in, uh, in history. But um, the main purpose is to help developers that aren't using Linux. Well, another purpose separate from distribution package manager is to help developers not using Linux gain some of the benefits of having a package manager. So. If you, want, if you want to develop on another platform, you don't have the distribution package manager. You still have dependencies. You need some way to actually get those. Um, and the main focus of the language package managers is to find and download dependencies for the developer. 
so rather than having to go out and look on the internet to find the library and then put it in the right place and so on, you have a little tool that you say, OK, give me the dependency, and then it down finds it and downloads it maybe from CPAN or maybe from PyPy, um, and then uh, you can use it in your code. Um, so it, this makes it a lot easier for developers to use dependencies in their software. Um, these tools then also usually take care of building the software, uh, if that's necessary. And they can also install the software on the system. So the user that's a little bit technical can actually use these tools to install software without having to use the distribution package manager, and thereby easily screw up their systems. But that's, that's another topic. Uh, so yeah, so now that we know what a package manager is, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about a few projects that I've been involved in and kind of um, get to why that's relevant uh, in this. So, so the first project that I've been involved in is Hawk, which is a web front-end for the pacemaker high availability stack and which runs on the cluster nodes themselves. So it's a, a Ruby and Rails app, a web app, um, and it's a pretty standard Ruby on Rails app. Other than that, we don't have a database. We just talk to the cluster uh, as the backend. Um, and uh, yeah, so Hawk itself is, is great. It's a little bit unusual to package web apps as RPM packages. Uh, and yeah, by the way, so uh, SUSE and OpenSUSE uses RPM as the packaging format. Uh, so I'm going to mention that. Um, so it's a little bit unusual to package web apps as packages, but as software becomes web apps more often, as stack com becomes more standard format, I think this is going to become more common, and the, the problems that we have are going to be more uh, frequent. Um, so uh, packaging uh, Hawk as an RPM has been a little bit challenging. Uh, so the first thing that makes it challenging is that a Rails app uh, has quite a few dependencies. Um, just the, the sheer number of uh, gems that an, that an average web app depends on. So in this case, Hawk is not too bad. Um, it has around 25 direct dependencies, and 15 of those are other gems. And mostly that's Rails. Um, then on top of that, we have about 45 indirect gem dependencies. So that's mostly Rails dependencies and so on. Uh, so that's a total of 70 dependencies. Uh, so, and actually there's more because I haven't counted dependencies of those dependencies that are not gems. So uh, the packages that Rails depend on um, that aren't gems themselves but are system libraries, I haven't counted those. And then there's the whole system and all that. But, but this is kind of uh, a number. Um, and that, this is kind of the number of dependencies that I need to care about. Um, and the, the problem for me is that we, we are packaging all of these dependencies as individual RPM packages. Um, and the reason for that is to we can uh, security patch and track uh, versions and so on uh, using our uh, package manager. Um, and that part in itself isn't too bad, thanks to some clever RPM macros that we have and, and the open build service. Uh, but the thing is that we share all of these gems with other op applications that also are packaged for OpenSUSE. Uh, so there's a single set of packages for Rails 4, for example, which is the Rails version that we use. And whenever any of these packages are updated to a new version, there's one of two things that tend to happen. Uh, either Rails breaks, uh, in which case I have to go and find which of Rails dependencies has been updated to a version that Rails itself is not compatible with, and then repackage the older version that Rails needs in a separate package and make that available in the distribution. Or uh, Hawk breaks, in which case I have to figure out what the change is and then make Hawk compatible with the new version. Uh, so uh, this is a bit of a pain, but it's, but it's manageable. I can do it. Um, but for the next version of Hawk, we're looking at moving to a little bit more modern client-side UI. Uh, so that's something like React or Ember or Angular. Or, and there's any number of these. And, uh, yeah, so Ruby dependency hell has nothing on JavaScript dependency hell. Um, so I was looking at one of these JavaScript libraries, and I'm not going to say which one, because I, I don't want to, this is not about 
I'm pointing fingers in that sense, and I'm going to describe more about why I think that. But um, uh, so this uh, framework is actually described as a lightweight alternative to Angular 2, uh, which is the replacement for Angular 1. Uh, and I downloaded the basic like Hello World example and ran npm update to get, get the dependencies. And uh, npm proceeded to install 759 dependencies. Um, and that's direct dependencies, not nested dependencies. Um, and I, I'm not trying to pick on JavaScript or, or this particular framework. Uh, I actually don't think this is any worse than any other project that kind of follows this development model. Um, but there's also there's no way that I'm going to maintain and care for RPM packages for each of those 759 dependencies. So, so when it comes to Hawk, the current packaging strategy that we have, the current way of tracking um, dependencies in, in the distribution, uh, isn't really going to work. Uh, so I mean, for, for what we have now, it's a little bit painful, but it's manageable. For going forward to moving to one of these new UI libraries, that model is just not going to work. It's just fall apart. We don't have the manpower to, to handle 759 dependencies uh, and, and keep track of everything. So, so yeah, that, that made me a little bit sad. Uh, next story. So for those who don't know, um, Rust is a new programming language from Mozilla, or developed mainly by Mozilla, I should say. Uh, it's gotten very popular. And the biggest selling point of Rust is that it's a language that guarantees memory safety without having a garbage collector or a virtual machine. And it compiles down to efficient native code. Um, and that makes Rust usable in places where uh, previously only C or C++ were, were options. So for me, as someone who develops uh, high availability software, having a language that is uh, a systems language but guarantees a lot more memory safety is a, is a really attractive uh, alternative. And uh, yeah, this is some Rust code. I'm not going to describe Rust any more than that. Um, if you're interested in Rust, there was an introduction this morning, so you can just travel back in time and, and go to that. Um, but yeah, the, there's, there's probably options for you still. Um, so uh, Rust, just like any other mo modern programming language, comes with its own package manager. Uh, in, in this case, it's a tool called Cargo. Um, and the packages themselves are called crates. And there's a, a repository for crates called crates.io. Uh, and I think that as far as package managers for programming languages goes, Cargo is probably at the apex of usability at the moment. Um, it was created by Yehuda Katz, who also created Bundler for Ruby. And he was also involved in creating Yarn, which is a new package manager for uh, Node.js created by Facebook. Um, I don't know to which extent, and I don't know if maybe Yarn is then the next level, uh, but, uh, but I'm familiar with Cargo, and it, it, it's, uh, it's a really interesting project. Uh, so developing code using Cargo uh, is, is a really painless and beautiful process. And it's, you know, if, you're, if you're a developer and you're not, you haven't seen it, you, you should really try it out, because it's, it's really nice. So some examples is that if you want to create a new application or library, you use Cargo New. And if, if, you, want, if you want a library, you pass a flag that says, I need a library. Uh, when you want to compile your project, you say Cargo Build, and it compiles everything. Um, you write down the dependencies that you need in a, a little configuration file. And then you run Cargo Update, and it gets all the dependencies, and everything's great. Um, and you can also set little flags for dependencies. So if you need a particular dependency that has a particular version and one option for that library, you can set that, and it, it will get that for you. Um, to build the documentation, you run Cargo Doc. Uh, to run the tests, you run Cargo Test. Um, when, you, when you're happy with the library and you would put it to create I.O., you run Cargo Publish. Uh, there's basically commands for everything. Uh, if you're wondering what kind of libraries are available for me to use, you run Cargo Search, and you can find them. Um, so it's basically providing everything that you need as a developer to develop your software. Um, another aspect of, of Rust that is kind of interesting is that um, they've avoided dependency hell in an interesting way, which is that let's say that 
my application called A depends on two libraries, B and C. And library B depends on another library called D, and it needs version one of that library. And library C ne also needs library D, but it needs version two of that library. And uh, if, you're, if you're coming from the C world, you would think like this is probably impossible. You, we're going to need to resolve this somehow. Uh, but the way Rust works is that it hashes all the symbols for each uh, library with a unique hash so that you can link them all together. And library B will find the right version of D, and library C will find the right version of D. And it's fantastic. You don't have dependency header. You can just depend on whatever you want. Um, and so having a nice tool like this makes it really easy for a developer to add new dependencies to a project. They can just look at the things they need and what kind of libraries are out there to solve those needs and add those and write their code. And they don't really have to worry about collisions or uh, dependencies and that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, so this pretty much solves dependency help for Rust developers. Um, th there's really no need to worry. Uh, extremely nice. Uh, the next interesting feature or tool for, for Rust is a tool called Rust Up. Um, and again, this is a tool that is really, really nice if you're a developer. Um, what it does is that instead of, ins instead of installing the compiler, you just install the tool called Rust Up. Um, and then you just ask Rust Up for the version of the compiler that you need. Uh, so uh, Rust is developed at a six-week development cycle, so there's a new version of the compiler every six weeks. And since it's a pretty new language, every new version of the compiler usually has some interesting features. So you, you kind of want to stay up to date. And it's even the case that most of the time, the nightly builds of the compiler have new interesting features that you might want to depend on. So uh, you, doing that with Rustup is really easy. You just run Rustup uh, install nightly, I think, or something like that. And you just get the right compiler that you want. Um, and uh, as a consequence of having these tools, um, and coupled with Rust being a statically typed language, is that actively developed Rust applications tend to depend on features that are only available in nightly builds of the compiler. Uh, so if we, as a distribution, want to package a lot of Rust applications, we would potentially need to provide quite a lot of different versions of the Rust compiler. Uh, so this is, this is just a quote from a readme for one of the projects written in Rust. Um, and you can see that it's actually really easy. It's, you can imagine, depending on nightly builds of other compilers, that would kind of seem difficult uh, for someone to use. But when it comes to Rust, it's, it's a single line, uh, and you, you've got it. Super easy. So, so kind of all of these features that Rust and Cargo and Rust Hub have are really great for developers. And I, I keep saying that because I, I want to focus on the fact that this is actually progress. This is great stuff. Um, but at the same time, they're making life really difficult for distributions. Um, none of the things that I mentioned are problems for anyone who don't care about relying on the Rust project infrastructure or Mozilla servers uh, when building, or care about being able to build software without an internet connection. Uh, but if you want to have fine control over uh, the source code that you use, for example, if you need to track the exact code that you're shipping, you need to know which license it has, you need to know that the code actually matches the binaries and so on, um, then using these tools become a lot more difficult. Um, so uh, it's kind of doing these two things made me very frustrated. Like I was spending a lot of time trying to resolve these problems or resolve these issues, managing, packaging these things. And the whole time I was feeling like I'm trying to swim up a waterfall. Like why am I even doing this? Um, why am I trying to manage packages for a package manager through packages for another package manager? This seems crazy. Um, and interesting, while I was preparing this talk, uh, Russ Cox, who is one of the core developers of the Go programming language, um, and one of the developers of the Go tool that Go uses to manage dependencies and build software and so on, uh, wrote an essay about SAT solvers and MP-complete problems, um, uh, which is that uh, the de dependency resolution problem is an NP-complete NP problem that you need a SAT solver to really solve properly. And a lot of these language package managers don't use that. 
And in fact, a lot of distribution package managers don't use a proper set solver either. It's just a few that do it. Um, but if you, if you really want to do it right, you have to use that tool. And uh, the thing he's saying is that, is it, is it really a good idea to build our software using these complicated algorithms? Uh, are, are we doing something wrong? And um, yeah, I, I read that article and I, and I felt a little bit better because at least I'm not the only one struggling. Um, uh, but at the same time, I kind of realized that this is going to be a baseline expectation for programming languages pretty soon. Um, every single programming language is going to have tools like Cargo and that do at least this much, at least as much as Cargo does for a developer, and maybe even more. Uh, which means that the role, the first role that the distribution package manager filled for developers tracking dependencies is no longer needed. They don't need, don't need, they don't need that anymore. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe it's, you know, we don't really need distributions anymore as developers. Um, so I, I kind of, yeah, the, the realization is that C and C++ as well are going to have tools like this. So the C++ standard, any day now, is going to have a standard for modules. And as soon as there's a standard for it, there's going to be a package manager for C++ that everyone uses. Uh, there, there is already one called Conan, but it's not really in wide use. But as soon as the model, module format is standardized, I'm pretty sure that everyone's going to use it. Um, so yeah, things seem bleak. Um, but uh, so one option is to just complain and say that you know, kids these days, they're just doing the things the wrong way. Uh, and I, I do that. It happens. Uh, but the thing is, it's not going to get us anywhere. Uh, reality is that the world changes. And unless software changes with the world, um, that itself is a change to the role of that software. Uh, for example, a perfectly p fine piece of software written for an obsolete computer no longer serves the purpose that it was designed for, even though the code is exactly the same. So when, when we talk about change, it's not just that software changes in itself, but everything changes, including the, the, the circumstances that the software was written in. So the only reasonable way to deal with things changing is to accept that and to roll with it. So let's just say that packaging each library atomically, like we do today, isn't going to work anymore. Um, what does that mean? What do we have to do to be able to package software that can't be packaged like we used to? So uh, Rich Hickey is the creator of the Closure programming language. And he coined a term called complex in a talk uh, named Simple Made Easy, which I recommend everyone watch. Um, uh, he also had another talk called Speculation, which is kind of related to the dependency problem as well. Um, so yeah, there, there's a lot I could have fit into this talk, but I don't have time. Um, but complexing so something is to interweave different things. So it's software that is complex. Software that is complex is complected because there's different things that should be separate things that are weaved together, which makes it hard to think about each of those things because you have all these other things in a way. So to decomplex something is to look at some, some tool or some software and think about what are the actual pieces of it, and is there any way that we can separate these and look at them in isolation? Um, because it's really hard to think about something unless you can actually isolate it from other factors around it. So one of the things that, it, that I thought is packaging and package management are not actually the same thing. And I think this is one of the reasons why Docker has gotten so popular so quickly, is that we actually need to separate the act of building packages from the act of distributing packages. Uh, to tie these two things together makes it really hard to progress on either one, because they're kind of both stuck in the same tools. So if you want to experiment with new ways of constructing packages or constructing software, you have to build a whole operating system around it. Um, and I, my question is, is there a way we can fix that? So maybe one thing that could enable innovation is that instead of if we were building tools and solutions all the time, maybe we should think about making a protocol for managing packages. 
uh, maybe a, a common metadata format that isn't complex with details about the actual contents of the package or how to build it. So that's, that's one idea. Uh, and I think that another thing that's going to happen is that the way that the base system is managed is going to have to be separated from the way that applications are managed. Uh, I don't think that necessarily means that they have to be packaged differently or use different tools, but I, but I think that constructing an operating system and building applications are not really the same thing. It's kind of a quirk of history that they all got mixed up in Linux. Uh, I don't think it was ever the goal to make it difficult to install software for one distribution on another distribution. That kind of just happened. Uh, but I don't think we have to be prisoners of history and just stick with that. I think there's ways that we can resolve that problem. And another question is, well, what is the role of distributions if we do these things, if we separate packaging from package managers, if we separate application building from system building? Uh, and so I work for distributions, so maybe I'm biased in this, but I actually don't think any of this is a threat to distributions. Um, as long as distributions figure out a way to solve these issues or work, come, move forward. Um, so there's a number of things that distributions do that we still need to get done regardless of what the so actual software looks like. So there's question of support, there's curation of packages, security patching and trust, uh, maintenance, uh, choices of desktop environment and base system, uh, look and feel and application selection. All of these things are services that distributions provide that someone is still going to have to provide. Um, and uh, I actually think that it might actually lessen the pressure on distributions if they didn't have to provide the whole universe of applications out there. So one thing that I would like to see is if we manage to separate applications from the base system, uh, that we, maybe we could see mini distributions that maybe don't provide an operating system themselves, but they curate and maintain collections of applications. Uh, imagine something like a music creation hub or a video editing hub, a community of people interested in a specific topic that can lift the burden of packaging applications for that topic away from distributions and help developers and upstream projects with bug triaging and maintenance and things like this. And that, again, that calls for an open protocol for app stores so that we can interoperate between different small app stores and distributions together. So, and I, I think there are some projects out there that are trying to solve these things. Uh, and I don't think the diversity of the Linux system is a hindrance here. There's no reason why systems couldn't support multiple protocols at the same time, for example. Um, and yeah, there's, there's a lot of questions like, what, what would this actually look like? Like, how do you track licenses for software when you have a thousand dependencies that you have to keep track of? Uh, how do you security patch things when every application has copies of the library and maybe even multiple copies in, in every application? Um, and yeah, there's like two ways of looking at that question. Uh, either you just dismiss it and say, well, the way we did it before is better. And I don't think that's going to be viable much longer. That's kind of the realization that I had trying to package Rust application is that developing in this way is so nice that I actually want to do this for every language. Uh, the other option then is to think about what might solve those problems. And I think that's actually a pretty exciting possibility, because now the future is open. So the question is, how do you invent the future when you don't know what it looks like? Um, and the best way to do that is just to try different things. The only way to be creative is to play around. And that's actually something that I think the Linux community and the open source community is especially good at. And it's a strength that we have that proprietary software don't, is that we have a lot of people that don't care, agree with each other and will do things their own way. And that's the best way to figure out what the best solution is moving forward. And actually, this community is pretty good at adopting solutions when it becomes clear that this is the way, best way to do it. Uh, so in that spirit, I, I would like to mention a few projects that I think are interesting um, that are kind of moving things forward in the space. Um, but before I do that, um, I just want to say one thing about managing state. So one idea from functional programming is that managing state is very difficult. Um, and state is basically having something that changes so that when you look at it first, it looks one way, and then you look back and it's, it has changed. So time becomes a factor in everything. Uh, and that's really difficult to reason about. It's much easier to reason about the system if you have clear flows where you have 
inputs and outputs, and in the process, nothing changes. Um, and another effect of state is, yeah, that when you do things twice, you may have two different results. This is something that happens with the old-fashioned distribution package all the time. We're basically managing the state of an entire operating system and every single application in it all at once. And uh, there's just so many variables that it becomes really, really hard to manage. And there's a lot of weird quirks in the software that we have that's all designed to mitigate the problem of managing state. So the question is, how do you fix that? And one of the projects that are trying to do that is a project called Nix. Uh, and there's another project called uh, Guix. Uh, so functional dependency management is a way to take the ideas from functional languages, and Haskell in particular, in the case of Nix and Guix, um, and to treat system composition as something like the tree of hashes that Git has. So packages are installed based on a hash of the actual sources that they're built with. Uh, to separate locations. And the environment it updated to, up to point to the latest version of these dependencies. Uh, so this solves a number of problems uh, when it comes to package management. Uh, first of all, there's no dependency held, because each version of a package strictly depends on the exact version that it needs. Um, with Nix and Guix, you also manage configuration files and data files in the same way. So you can capture the whole state of the system with basically we use a single hash. And that, as an aside, is something that's really attractive to me as a, a bug issue uh, worker, or what you call it. That if I get an issue from someone, they can just give me the hash of the system, and I can just see exactly what the state of the system was uh, and reproduce the issue. Um, there's, there is some issues with this. So if you update the base package, um, you kind of have to update everything behind it. Uh, but there are ways to mitigate this. And since each actual version of a package is immutable and doesn't change and is hashed, you can cache all of those things. So if, if something actually doesn't change, you just reuse the package that you already had. Um, so I, I think. Nix and Guix are kind of just scratching the surface of the possibilities, and they are really interesting, really interesting project. Um, another ar area that is really interesting is uh, containers and container technology. And it's, I think that's also something that's just starting to show its promise for sandboxing and abstracting the base system so that we can run applications on different systems without having to have you know, readme files that says, oh, how do I install this and this instructions for every single distribution? It's just a mess. So there are some projects that are trying to solve this. Uh, AppImage is an older project. Uh, Snap is newer. Flatpak is also newer. Uh, they're all heavy in development. And I, I don't think any of them have quite reached the point where they need to be. But uh, I also think that's a good thing, because you know, uh, if, it, if it's not finished, it's, there's still a future to be discovered. Uh, so system D is kind of a controversial topic. Uh, but I think uh, one interesting thing about uh, system D is how it kind of reinvented what the init system of Linux is supposed to be and started a discussion about the base system that I didn't really see before. Um, and another aspect of that, that is, which is interesting is how quickly system D got adopted by so many of the major distributions. And to me, that shows that it actually is possible to change how fundamental aspects of the Linux system works. We actually can re reinvent something like logging. Um, plus, I actually think systemd has some really good ideas, but that's not what this talk is about either. Um, another project which is interesting is Cubes OS. Uh, so this is a distribution that focuses on security and strict sandboxing. And uh, it's a really interesting approach to uh, building a system is kind of a complete reimagining of what an oper uh, operating system fundamentally looks like. Uh, another project that's kind of like this is uh, Project Atomic and CoreOS. Um, it's also really cool things. And the last thing of these that I want to talk about is re reproducible builds. Uh, so I definitely agree that re we need reproducible builds to move forward. And figuring out how we can get that while still managing to package all of these things it's going to be an interesting problem that I hope a lot of people are going to think about. Uh, and my final thing that I want to say is that um, 
So Alan Kay is uh, one of the inventors of things like the graphical user interface and tablet computers at Xerox Park in the 70s. And he made a talk called The Future Doesn't Have to be Incremental, uh, where he says that just relying on incremental changes to what we already have is maybe not the best way to invent the future. And sometimes we just have to think, what will technology look like in 15 years or 10 years or 15 years? And it, totally ignore the state of things as they are today. And just think, what do we want a computing system to look like in the future? And then build that future. And I, I think that's, that's kind of the approach that uh, we ought to be taking. So uh, thank you, everyone. That's, that's my time. Thank you, Christopher. That was excellent. Um, we do have plenty of time for questions. We have uh, five minutes on the clock. So does anyone have a, a question for Chris? Yeah, great. You mentioned an open protocol for something like an app store. Um, can you give us a bit of an idea of what that might look like? So there is a, yeah, so, um, there is a project for doing this. Uh, which is actually used by Flatpak and I think Snap as well for communicating uh, application metadata from an app store. Uh, so, so this project actually already exists, but I don't remember exactly what it's called. Uh, maybe someone else uh, remembers that, but yeah. So, so that's something that's kind of already exists. So the thing that I kind of feel is that right now we're kind of dreaming a little bit small. Everyone's trying to build something on top of what we already have. But I think we kind of have to think bigger because uh, the situation with dependencies is catching up to us very, very quickly. Uh, and yeah, we, we kind of need to work, work on that. One more here. Um, sort of by definition, the language package managers only care about one language. So you know, imagine some example of a Ruby program that needs a module that happens to be implemented in Rust that in turn needs a C library or something. Um, Gem is not going to help you build that. Cargo is not going to help you build that. Um, and yet, for distro packages, that's bread and butter. That's so not interesting. There's not even you know, anything special to allow that. I wonder how, do you have any ideas how we can get the, the like benefits, the cross-language benefits of the distro packages and yet make them comfortable and nice like the language packages? Because at the moment, everything's kind of stuck in their language silos. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. And I think this is something that's going to hit people when the distro package managers start going away. That's when people are going to realize that this is actually an issue, that we can't just sit in our little silos in this programming language and use our own amazing tools and then ignore everything around it, because uh, you actually need some kind of more information about your whole dependency chain. So. So my answer to that is that I think projects like Nix actually kind of helps with that, uh, doing, doing things the way where you don't have to resolve the dependency management problem. You don't have to write a SAT solver and all these things, because you're depending on exactly the version that you tested with, and that's the version that you deliver in your application and so on. Uh, I think that's probably the way forward, even for that. Yeah. How do you deal with cloud rot? The, the fact that you know you depend on something on some other site that may not be there on Tuesday, yeah. You know, I not just you know things constantly going away in Android because it depends on a server or Diablo three is doomed sort of thing, but I, I've noticed some intentional sabotage from time to time. Uh, for example, um, the last GPLv two releases of GCC and bin utils, you know, Xcode was shipping them for five years until they got LLVM ready and stuff. And the Free Software Foundation deleted the tarballs off their website, created right. a bin utils 217a dot tar dot gz they'd added GPLv three code to, and symlinked the old name to that. You know, if if you're adding endless dependencies and you're making infrastructure to have more to track more and more dependencies. How does that become tractable going forward when there's like more and more people it all has to work? Yeah, so I don't have a simple answer to that. Uh, I think we need to get developers to realize that the internet is not a permanent thing. It's actually something that changes all the time. Uh, and I think it can be very hard to remember that 
<laughs> companies fail. You know, like things like Google and Mozilla and uh, Apple and Mi Microsoft are not permanent entities. And at some point, they might actually disappear. And at that point, if you rely on their infrastructure, you're going to have issues. So this is something that I don't know if, you know, some lessons have to be learned the hard way. And uh, I don't know if uh, it really, if I really have an answer to that, other than trying to remind people that this is a thing. Uh, but yeah, I, maybe, so, so for distributions, maybe an option would be to cache things. So you would do an initial build, download all the packages over the internet, and then you have like a reproducible base, but instead of downloading again, you, have, you save all of those things, so you don't have to do that, and trick software into thinking that they're going out on the internet. So kind of working around the, the issue, because I think one of the issues is that we try to do things right. We try to say like, no, this is wrong. You're doing it wrong. And the thing is, there's a lot more people doing it wrong than there are people who know what the right thing is. And there is there's just more and more of those people. There's just going to be more and more wrong. And if we can't deal with that, we're not going to survive. I mean, that's, that's how I see it. Um, yeah, so related to that, uh, uh, and the caching problem. Uh, what role do you see with the automation of a lot of these, I guess, grunt work tasks that need to be done but don't necessarily need a human babysitting them? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know exactly how that would relate to these issues. I mean, I think, you know, automation is good. Like, the less burden we can take off uh, packages we, as possible, that's, that's a good thing. But you still need you still need someone to actually know, you know, look at all these things and sort them out. And yeah, I don't know if automation is going to solve any of those problems. Um, but yeah, that's. Yeah. We'll have to wrap it up there. Thank you very much for your time. And thank you again, uh, Christopher, if you'd all join me in thanking him again for his presentation. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks again. Okay, the ne next session starts in 10 minutes. So uh, stay here if you want to or.